try and uh, wrap things up. I know when we get back, they get real busy uh, real quick. And uh, so that's why I try to get, uh, or trying to get all of your uh, homework done and get that back to you as well as work on those tests. So I haven't got a chance to look at the test yet. Um, that is coming soon and uh, so I'll probably get started with grading that uh, Friday. I Actually, hopefully uh, tomorrow, but it doesn't look like I'll quite get there. I've got another bunch of other loose ends I want to uh, get done here, but uh, that's my hope. And my hope is to, to get it graded um, between Friday and Sunday. And so if you look Sunday, you will uh, you know, probably see uh, some scores. And somewhere in there, I'm also hoping that I can work out the solutions and I'll send that link out to you too so you can, you can have that to look over uh, at, at spring break. And then of course when we, we come back, then I'll, I'll give those tests back to you on the Monday when we, we get back. But uh, for my view, I'm trying to just stay focused on let's get those tests done, let's pretend like there's no spring break coming up and if there was class on Monday, I'd want to get them done Sunday so I can get them back to you on Monday and if I can keep that focused, I will be able to wake up Monday morning and go, oh yeah, I don't have to uh, do anything. I got everything graded and there's no classes. Uh, so that's kind of uh, my, my game plan. Meanwhile, let's get you set up because over the spring break, you're going to want to look here at chapters 9 um, and maybe even 10, uh, but definitely chapter 9. And as I was saying, chapter 9 is a, a pretty long chapter and we did it's more than one half, but it's really half of the, the topic, the conservation of momentum. And so let me summarize what we did in the last lecture. So obviously the last class, you took an exam. But the last lecture, a week ago Wednesday, we said something along these lines, that if you had two objects interacting, and so let's say object one, and then let's say object two. So they come along and they, they hit. Well, we went through a long procedure, if you will, and so let's not repeat it now, although we're going to have to do this kind of on, on part two of the, of the lab. But we were, our lab, the uh, lecture, we were able to show that if there was no outside forces, and I want to keep emphasizing that because that's about to change. The second half of this chapter is what if there are outside influences, okay? But if there are no outside forces, we would say the momentum is conserved. And that's kind of a two-step process because momentum would be conserved not only in the X direction, but it would also be conserved in the Y direction. And of course, do not forget the chapter before this, which was conservation of energy. And of course, you just did a big test on it, so I'm sure you studied it many times, but you said that the initial energy is equal to any final energy. And so we, a week ago, were looking at that and those pieces of the, of the puzzle, if you will. And so I thought it would be wise to start off today, even though we're not done, <coughs> excuse me, lecturing on the chapter, to, to look in the back of the book, to look at problems like this, so that at least if we don't quite finish all of chapter 9, you'll have seen quite a few examples as you move into spring break. And you probably then can do most of of the homework. But I think we can even get further than that. I think not only we'll see some examples, but we can talk about the last half of the chapter, or the last part of the chapter. Like I said, it's not half in terms of length, it's half in terms of concept. But what if that additional piece, what if there are some outside influences? And so let's hold off with the outside influence, but let's do a bunch of examples, starting with number 22. Number 22, I think is a really good one here. to get started. And so jumping somewhere over here to number 22 and making this a little bit bigger. So we decided 
at 140 percent works really well but let's read number 22 and you'll you'll see the idea and particularly the conservation let's be at the bottom here the conservation of momentum and so here's what it says it says a seven gram bullet is fired from a gun into a one kilogram block of wood it is held in a vise keep that in mind uh, it says it penetrates the wood eight centimeters now this block of wood is placed now on a frictionless horizontal surface and a second seven gram bullet is fired into or from the gun into the block to what depth does this bullet penetrate so hopefully you'll see the two differences here one of them being we have a bullet that is traveling and about to impact a large piece of wood that is then held in place with some kind of clamp here. I'll just kind of draw a little C clamp here like we have in the lab. And so with a little C clamp, we, we clamp it down. And so this bullet's going to come in. And the first part that they say is the bullet penetrates eight centimeters before it comes to rest. Well, obviously it comes to rest because of the rubbing, the interaction, the friction between the bullet and the piece of wood. But the second little experiment is different. The second experiment... The bullet is coming in, and now, instead of being in a vise, it is sitting on a frictionless table. What happens here? All right, well, let's run through this. The reason it's in this chapter is this is a long and nice discussion on conservation of momentum. Is it or is it not conserved? So if we look at the interaction between the bullet and the block, so let's call the bullet and the block our our system and so like we have here we have two objects interacting the first time the first time when it's clamped do we have conservation of momentum are there any outside forces on the bullet block system yeah there is right the clamp the clamp itself the clamp itself is not allowing this to move. And so if we look at the block and the bullet system, we could not say initial momentum equals final. Just not true. Because we do have an outside influence. However, the second one, what could you say about the second one? then there is no outside influence. And that one, we do have conservation of momentum. And so we've got two different problems, and it's why I picked it first, because again, this is based on conservation of momentum. And one of the things you need to recognize right away is, is momentum conserved? Yes or no? And our whole argument was there is this special case, no outside influences, then we have our momentum is conserved. And so this problem, I think, does a great job of illustrating that because it gives us one time where it is not conserved and it gives us another time where it is conserved. And so if I were to put kind of a line between these two scenarios, I would have conservation of momentum for this one. Um, if I call little m the mass of the bullet and it's traveling with a speed of little v, it then hits the block, capital M, and then the block starts moving with a speed of capital V, then what I would say is little m times little v must be equal to big M plus little v times big v. And so that's our conservation of momentum. True here, not true here. So there's nothing I can write in the first case in terms of momentum. However, another reason this makes a good problem is don't forget 
the past chapter. What about the energy? Well, applying our energy here, we would know that the energy is conserved. Uh, it always was conserved, at least as long as we also include other outside influences. Um, I don't think we need that. The only thing going on here really is some heat and some kinetic energy. So in this top case, I would say one half mv squared. And so again, using the same notation as the bottom one, this is the little m and the little v. That would be the kinetic energy before it made impact. And then, of course, being clamped in here, none of that energy shows up as kinetic energy. Where does it all go? Doesn't it all go to heat? And so after the impact, there is no more kinetic energy. There was just rubbing of the bullet in the, in the block. And so that would be applying conservation of energy to that top one. And I could just as well do that same principle, different results, down here at the bottom. The bottom I would have the kinetic energy, one half mv squared, goes where? Well, clearly it is moving. But there is also quite a bit of rubbing going on. And so there's some heat. Now, just to make sure it's clear here, I'm not saying the same amount of heat that is created in number one is the same as the heat created in, in scenario number two. I mean, there could be different amounts. And they should be different amounts. Uh, you can see that for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is this one is actually moving, meaning that not all of this can go to the heat. We actually have some movement. So we're going to get less heat in this second one. Uh, another way of saying that same thing is the heat is generated by the frictional force times the distance it moves. This one then, once the bullet begins to penetrate, probably doesn't penetrate as deeply. It doesn't go a whole eight centimeters. Uh, you can kind of see that as the, as the bullet comes in, it actually pushes the block back a little bit, and therefore the bullet doesn't get a chance to embed itself quite as deeply. And remember, the heat is the force of friction times the distance it traveled. And so I would suspect that this distance is less than eight centimeters. And also, for that reason, then, I would suspect that the heat is a little bit less. Exactly. And so those two fit together. In fact, I'll even write it that way. The heat in number one would be the force of friction. So let me write it as the kinetic friction because I got this solid rubbing on a solid. I've got a, a bullet, which is probably made out of lead, rubbing against the, the wood. And it penetrated a distance of eight centimeters. And so that would be the heat that is created during the impact. Whereas down here, and so let me just write the, the first term. The heat would be the force of friction times some distance it traveled. Uh, maybe I'll actually put D. I know in chapter 7 we used an F and an R. But since I keep using the word distance, I'll, I'll, I'll replace the R with a D there. But there's the, the big question. How far is that one right there? Okay. Well, maybe now you can kind of see the strategy for solving this uh, because we can use the information from the first experiment to do some substituting in. And plus we can use the information in the second experiment, which is both conservation of energy and conservation of momentum. And we can figure out then the rest of the piece here. Um, so I'm kind of thinking maybe the approach here is to eliminate one of the variables. 
Uh, and it looks like force of friction from up here might be nice to place right there. So this equation becomes Actually, I wonder if it would be easier to substitute it the other way. Yeah, let me... Let me try a little different... Well, I don't know, maybe... Uh, can't, well, I can't decide which one's easier. They seem like about the same. Uh, but, but, but I like the, I guess, the, the substitution part that if I were to solve this for a V and put it in there and leave that alone, then I'd get F's in every one. All right, I'll, I'll do that approach. Um, so this first one right here, would actually then be force of friction times a distance of 8 meters. And so this term is that term right there. And then the next term, which I'll jump over to here, has this 1 half big M little m. And then it has this V squared in it. But that big V squared, I can use this one up here and write it as MV over M plus little m squared. So that would be my little V. Or that would change my big V into a little V. And then, of course, over here, I still have this force of friction times the distance traveled. And the reason I liked all that is because I was looking ahead and I saw the one half and then over here I see that if I take the M and the V squared and just one of the M's but both of the V's and put them together and then over here I will still have an M there, and then the two M's here cancel with one up there. And so rewriting that equation, I have this one half MV squared, which, as we saw in the first part of the experiment right here, that would be a force of friction times the eight centimeters that it traveled. And then I can go force of friction times distance. And then that way I have force of friction in every term. And so instead of substituting it out, I essentially substituted out the V's and then we're left with the F's. But that was kind of the key step. I thought it would be nice to see that they're the same. So I'm going to cancel those off in every term. And so finally I get to my answer, which is the distance is what? And so it's 0.08 minus a little bit. And so not a surprise that that little bit is connected in some way to how much mass they have since there was this conservation of momentum and the movement of the block during the, the second experiment is going to be related to the ratio of the mass of the bullet to the mass of the of the block and so I see that showing in when they say the bullet is seven grams and the block is one kilogram if I remember right. <coughs> yeah. And so now I have the answer I can come up with here. What is D? And so that number is 0.08 times 0 0.007 divided by 1.007. And we get a small distance. 
5.08 minus 5.56 times 10 to the minus 4. And so 0 0.08 minus that last answer is 0 0.079 meters. So not much less, only one millimeter less. Uh, it's a heavy block. Uh, so that kind of explains it all. But like I said, it's not a real complicated one, but a good one in the sense that it's going to make you think through when is momentum conserved, when is it not. And it also illustrates conservation of energy. Don't forget that piece of the, of the puzzle. All right, well, let's try another one so you can get this to sink in a little bit more. How about number 25? Number 25 is, again, a lot like these, this one, although this time, instead of shooting a bullet, I think we have somebody throwing a, a piece of clay. So it says here, a 12-gram wad of sticky, that's important, going to stick together, clay is hurled horizontally at a 100-gram block initially at rest on a horizontal surface. The clay sticks to the block. After the impact, the block then slides 7.5 meters before coming to rest. If the coefficient of friction between the block and the surface is 0.65, what was the speed of the clay immediately before impact? All right, so a little different problem. But it illustrates something else we're going to do. Let me ask that first question. Is momentum conserved? And this one's a little harder to answer. So I'm glad some of you are kind of saying yes and no. Uh, this doesn't have an outside influence is always the question. You see the last one on the second experiment we said momentum was conserved because there was no outside influence. It was on a frictionless surface. But here it does have some friction. I mean here we have this block maybe I should put here number 25 and this block is 100 grams and we have this wad of clay at 12 grams that is going to come along and Maybe I'll draw the after picture here. And so here's the 100 grams and the 12 grams is stuck on the side of it. Okay. And of course it is now moving. So using the symbols that we did last time, let me use a capital V for moving after the impact here and a little v for moving before the impact. And the lighter one I'll put a V and the heavier one I'll put a capital M. So here's a capital M, here's a little M. And of course it is sliding along a rough surface. So is there any kind of outside influence? Well, well I guess I'd say there, there is this friction. So part of me is saying, well, it's not really conservation of momentum, but what, what about this? What if the impact happened really quickly, in a short amount of time? before the object really had a chance to move. Which probably isn't exactly correct, but it's probably reasonably correct. So watch this as we do the problems. This is a almost conservation of momentum. And it's pretty close to conservation of momentum. The, the slower the or maybe I should say the faster the contact time is. And so if this impact happens right away, then what I could say is the momentum immediately after the impact is the same as right before the impact. Of course, once it starts sliding, then the friction is an outside influence, and so then the momentum is being lost, and it goes slower and slower and slower and slower, and eventually stops. And when it stops, it has no momentum. 
So this one says it actually goes seven and a half meters before it comes to a stop. And what that tells me, of course, is there is an outside influence. But again, if I don't look at the total end of it, and so let's just say it goes to here. This is the seven and a half meters. I would be foolish to say that the momentum at the end of the slide is the same as the momentum before the impact. I mean, clearly it's not. It came to a stop. There's no momentum. And so the momentum is being lost because of that outside influence. However, it got lost as it was sliding along. And so I'm going to do this, which is not 100% accurate, but pretty darn close, maybe 99% accurate, depending on how much sliding occurs while the piece of clay is being squeezed. And so if the piece of clay actually is really quick, then I can say with somewhat confident that the momentum right after the impact is the same as before. But I would not say the momentum after it has slid for a meter or two or seven and a half meters is the same. And so that's why I wanted to pick this one to say watch for these. Watch for the um, immediately after the impact type of thing. In fact, Monday when we come back from spring break, that will be the experiment that we do. Uh, one of the classes, I think it was the evening one, I made that comment that we have those spring-loaded cannons, the same ones we did a few weeks ago where we shot a lob and we had to hit the pan. We'll get those out again. And this time, instead of shooting a lob to see how high it, or far it goes, we will point the cannonball straight and we will shoot it into a little object. It won't be a block of wood, but it'll be this little metal cup. And you're going to hit that cup and then it's going to swing that cup. And then we'll do some other things in the lab. But here's what we will say. We will say, the, even though there is a small outside influence, it is just that. It's small and for a short period of time. And so that the change in momentum, and that's where we started, being the integral of the force over a period of time. And even though there is a small outside influence, the time is really short. And so we will say that it is approximately zero during the impact. And so keep your eye out for problems like this. And this is an example of that. So when I write this on the board, I will say little m times little v is then equal to the big M plus the little m added together times the big V. But what I want to make sure it's really clear is that big V is the speed of the two of them immediately after the impact only. Not after it slides a meter or two. Okay? And that's what that whole discussion was about. So this is the speed right after the impact. Once it starts to slide, then clearly there's less speed. So I'm not going to apply conservation of momentum anymore throughout the problem. But I am going to apply conservation of energy. So again, let's go back a chapter and do something along this lines. I know that right before the impact, that piece of clay has that much kinetic energy. Right after impact, the clay and the piece of wood now stuck together have a kinetic energy and then probably some heat. I'll call it Q1. And so there is probably some heat that is formed right there with the rubbing between the clay and the wood as it makes the impact. And so again, don't forget there would be some heat there. Don't just put that. In fact, that without the Q is impossible to also equal that. And so 
though if I didn't put a Q in there, I would have a problem with my mathematics, I would see. I would see that there, there's no solution. You're right, you can't have a solution. When they stick together, there's got to be some heat created. In fact, the word we used was perfectly inelastic collision. And what did the word inelastic mean? Well, perfect part meant they stick together. But what did the inelastic mean? <laughs> yeah, it meant some heat was created in the impact, right? It means we lost some kinetic energy, right? So the word elastic and inelastic were related to its kinetic energy. So the word alone, perfectly inelastic, clearly implies here that we have an inelastic collision. We are going to get some heat. In fact, I'm not going to stop there. I'm going to say, okay, you see this kinetic energy there, which is not the entire kinetic energy that the bullet started with. It's a fraction of it. How much is probably something I can figure out along the way. But let's also talk about the energy as it slides. Because as it is sliding, I can't do a conservation of momentum. But I can talk about the energy. And so as it slides all the way across this seven and a half meters, then where does that kinetic energy go? It goes into heat. Oh, let me call it heat number two. This, this is the heat that is formed along the boundary or the surface between the wood and the table. And so the point is, we do have two different places for the heat to be formed. Don't mix the two. Very easy to do. And don't forget one. So conservation of momentum immediately before and immediately after only. And then conservation of energy at the collision and conservation of energy as it slides along. Okay. And in fact, taking this one step further, I can say the heat for number two is the kinetic friction times the distance it travels. And the kinetic friction is the coefficient of friction times the normal force times the distance it travels. And I think they've given me enough information to plug that one in here, right? They've given me the coefficient of friction, they've given me the masses, and they've told me how far it goes. And so as I put into numbers into this equation, I have one half and the two masses added together is 0.112. That would be final speed squared. Must then equal to the coefficient, which is 0.65, times the masses added together, 112, times G, 9.8, times a distance of seven and a half meters. In fact, there's a mass on each side, so there's no point in putting those into my calculator. I'll just cross those out now. So right here would be 0.65 times 9.8 times seven and a half. If I then multiply that by two and take the square root, we can get a number that says what is the speed immediately after the impact. Okay, and so that's what this line gives me. The speed immediately after the impact. The question said, what is the speed of the thrown piece of clay? So I'm not done. I have found capital V. But if you come back up here to our principle of conservation of momentum, we can find out what was the speed before. And so now I can put in my numbers here as 0 0.012 in terms of kilograms for the mass of the piece of clay. The little v is what I'd like to find. The 0.112 is the two of them now added together, and the speed after the collision is the number I just solved for, the 9.77.
And so 0.112 times 9.77, divide that by 0 0.012, coming up with a speed of 91.2 meters per second. So there's the speed of the thrown piece of clay, which, by the way, is about 200 miles an hour, so ever throwing this clay should probably uh, <laughs> think about a baseball career right here. The strikeout leader, assuming they can get it over the plate at that speed. So it's a huge speed. And there is our final answer. They didn't ask it, but I think it would be worth taking the time and saying how much is converted into heat here during the impact. Well, we have enough information to answer that, although it wasn't really asked for, but we didn't really even use that equation. And so I'm going to say here that I have this 1 half times the 0 0.012 times the 91.2 squared. That's the kinetic energy of the thrown piece of clay. Then the one half point one one two times this speed of nine point seven seven squared. Is the amount of energy that's converted to heat on this piece of clay. And so just out of curiosity, I'll do each one separate to kind of give you an idea. But this, this first one is probably quite a bit of energy. Yeah, 49.9 joules of energy. Whereas this second one, the kinetic energy after the collision, is relatively small compared to the kinetic energy before the collision. It's only around 5. And so a lot of heat energy here is created during this impact. And of course, the, the small one, the 5.3, is the kinetic energy still remaining after the impact. And that's the amount that would be equal to the Q2. And so most of this energy is converted into heat energy upon the impact. 44, close to 45. There's only five left for later on. Yeah. Uh, kind of it. Oh, okay, good. All right. So there is, like I said, a, a good second problem to look at. Uh, let's do 27. 27 takes us a, a step further here. Um, it's more of a two-dimensional process. And so the, the two I've shown you so far have been one-dimensional problems. And good ones to get started at because they allow us to see our conservational principles. And so I just want to emphasize, especially as used to go off and start doing these homework, don't forget to incorporate not only the conservation of momentum that we're talking about this chapter, but the conservation of energy that we've been doing in the past chapters. And in fact, when we come back from spring break, I'll give you that same warning when we get to the next chapter where we have a th called conservation of angular momentum. We'll do some problems there and I'll say, okay, don't forget your conservation of linear momentum and your conservation of energy also. You got to throw that into the mix and you'll have all three of them going on at the same time. And so you can imagine why I've been saying since the beginning that that chapter is the hardest chapter of the semester. And we're getting to put everything together at that. And we don't really have too much more physics uh, really uh, beyond that for this semester. Well, we've got a bunch of other little things to do, and that's what the, the chapters 12 and 
13 and 14 will be all about. Well, let's read here 27. Here, a billiard ball is moving at 5 meters per second and strikes a stationary second ball of the same mass. After the collision, the first ball moves at a speed of 4.33 meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees with respect to its original motion. Go ahead and assume an elastic collision. Oh, let me stop right there. Elastic means? No heat is created in this collision, right? The kinetic energy before equals kinetic energy after. Okay? So assume it's elastic. And go ahead and ignore the friction of the felt of the table here and the rotational motion. So again, maybe less than ideal problem since the real game of billiards, as you know, has some felt and some friction and has rolling of the ball. So it's a bit more complicated than that, but it's a, it's a good one to do. It says find the struck ball's velocity. All right, so if I was just drawing a picture, it might look something like this. Here's the first one, the cue ball, if you will. It has some mass, m, which they don't say what it is, but they do say it has an initial speed of 5 meters per second. That's kind of the initial conditions. And it is headed towards a second ball. It's going to strike that one. And so after the collision, they say this first one veers off At an angle, and I think I read 30 degrees, right? Yeah, at an angle of 30 degrees. And it lost some of its speed. It slows down, not a surprise. It hit something. It had to put a force on that second ball, so the second ball put a force on it. And it was opposite to the motion, so it slowed it down a little bit. So it both slowed it down and turned it. Okay. And so there's the, the first ball. The second ball, then, is probably going to be heading off something like this. Um, let me call it, let's see, unknown here. So why don't we call that a capital V? Actually, since we're not doing one dimension, maybe we should, yeah, I should use the same notation that your author picked up here on the two dimensions. He, he calls this V number two. Um, and he puts a little F here for final. So it's the, the final speed of, of number two. Looks like my blue marker, I didn't check for ink, is getting a little dry there. Let me switch to black here for a little bit. But this is the speed. And then there's some angle. Let's we'll call it theta. Which I don't recall them telling me that, right? No. So I... I don't know that. Uh, they did tell me it has a mass M and it's the same as that one. Okay. And so knowing that information, it looks like there's only two unknowns here. Which is good because I really have three equations. I mean, what are those three equations? I mean, I've got overkill here. Don't I have the initial momentum in the x direction is equal to the initial momentum in the, or the, excuse me, the final momentum in the x direction. And the initial momentum in the y direction is equal to the final momentum in the y direction. And the kinetic energy before is equal to the kinetic energy after. And that was our lecture a week ago about those three principles going on. So I have conservation of momentum and I have it in two dimensions. Although I suppose I should pause and just ask the same thing I was trying to illustrate in that first problem, number 22, that when is momentum conserved? Yeah, no outside influence. So that first one with the vice, we, we couldn't use conservation of momentum. But this one I can uh, because they're uh, hopefully making it very clear here that I can ignore the outside effect of the, of the felt, right? And I could probably even then do the same argument I did in the last one that I could say immediately after, even if there is an interaction with the felt, I could say immediately after the collision, the momentum is the same as immediately before if the contact time was reasonably small. 
and it probably is here. So with even with the felt, I could say conservation of linear momentum. Um, of course, if you hit it and it just starts sliding, then the felt's going to make it roll. And so after the collision, there's other interesting things that are going to happen that we will discuss in the following chapters when we get into things rolling. We haven't done that yet. But for this problem, I would say those are my three equations. And so as I write them down, I guess I would write them something like this. The mass times the speed before the collision. So there's the mass of the cue ball and the speed of five. It's heading along. The other one is not moving. So when I add up all the momentum in the x direction, it's just coming from the cue ball. Where does it go? Well, it goes to, or I should say remains part of the cue ball. And so this is the momentum in the x direction for the cue ball. But then I would also have an mv2f cosine of this unknown angle theta. And so the m times the v is the momentum and then multiplied by cosine gives me how much is moving in the x direction. And so I did that for both the cue ball and the struck ball. Okay? And so that is the equation I would be writing down to match those words. The momentum in the x direction before the collision equal the momentum in the y direction. And put a little dotted line because that was kind of a long equation. And let's look at this one. This one I would start off and say zero. Right? Before the collision, even though the cue ball is moving, it is not moving in the y direction. And the other one's not moving at all. So there is no momentum in the y direction. The cue ball, again, angles up. So this would be m times 4.33 <coughs> times the sine of 30 degrees. So that would be the momentum in the y direction. I'm going to put a negative because what do I notice about the struck ball? Yeah, it's going down. In fact, even if I didn't know anything about the, the game, I would probably would realize that it's got to go down because if one's going up, that's positive momentum. The other one must go down because they have to equal zero. That's our conservation of momentum. We have no up or down momentum before the collision, so we cannot have any after the collision. Okay, and so whatever goes up has to be matched with an equal amount of momentum down. And so that's why the minus is here, because it is going down, and that would be an M V final number two. Um, although I changed my order there. How about V two final? And then it would be the sine of theta. And I could probably stop right there because there are two unknowns which means I need two equations. I don't know speed and I don't know angle of the struck ball. And I suppose you may say we don't know the mass but the mass is just really a multiplication factor that shows up on every term. So we can cancel it off and we couldn't even find it if we if we wanted to. If we multiplied by any mass we would have the the same number. So it's not what we call an independent equation. It's just an added multiplication factor. But for completeness I'm going to go on to this third equation and say alright what is the kinetic energy? Well before the collision It's that. After the collision, it's one half m four point three three squared for the cue ball, and one half m v two final squared for the struck ball. 
And there's no heat here. Maybe I'll even put plus zero. But they said, go ahead and assume the collision is elastic. Which, in that sense, really made the problem almost too easy. Because if they had said, don't assume it's elastic, then I would have another unknown. And I would have three equations with three unknowns. Which would be, yeah, a little bit long in the algebra, but it's something I can do. Here, I now have three equations, but only two unknowns. So, pick any two of these three equations, whichever one you like better, and solve it. And so that was kind of nice. And in fact, looking at this one, I like this one a lot. Because it only has one unknown in it. And I can solve this one by itself. And that's a little bit nicer than having two equations that are coupled together. That's a little more work. So it's kind of your choice. You can just do these two and solve it, or you can jump over here. And I, since this one looks a lot easier, I'll do that. Uh, I will point out that there's a mass in every term that goes away, and there's a one-half in every term that goes away. And so this becomes a5 squared equals a4.33 squared plus the speed of number 2 squared. So grabbing my calculator, I should be able to punch in a few numbers here and get the speed of the struck ball. And so 5 squared minus 4.33 squared, hit enter, and then take the square root of all of that getting me a speed of two and a half meters per second. And so there's the speed after the collision of the, of the struck ball. And now I can use that to put in either that equation or that equation, wouldn't matter which one. Since this one looks a little bit easier, why don't I do this one? And so here I would have 0 equals, and uh, sine of 30 is a half, so that's 2 uh, and then 17 and a half, and that is 2 and a half, and that is sine of theta. And so if I solve this, what do I get? 2.175 uh, divided by 2.5 and take the arc sine, then I get 60 degrees. And hopefully that would confirm what I get over there. It'll also confirm something else that at least I know, and um, it uh, used to be a homework problem, but he took it out of the seventh edition, so I don't think you, you, I don't think I have it assigned there for the uh, homework anymore. But it is kind of a nice little proof to show that if you ever have two objects where one is stationary and they each have the same mass, and the collision is elastic, so bunch of special conditions there, but that's the conditions we have. So, second object stationary, all right, equal masses, and elastic collision, and those happen a lot, then the angles always add up to 90 degrees. And uh, like I said, it's a nice mathematical proof one. It's a more of a magenta problem. And like I said, he used to have it. I used to assign it, but he's taken it out. And so I'll just say that without proof that that is what will happen in that special case. And this is that special case. And so sure enough, we should get a 60 degrees. I would, because I knew that, I'd be surprised if I came up with anything other than 60 degrees. Um, it's why if you've ever played the game of billiards, uh, a nice strategy to teach somebody is to say, all right, if you hit this ball and you ignore the rolling effects, so there's a whole more complicated part of that, but basically put, if you hit this cue ball kind of low, so that basically you hit it, it has kind of a backspin and then it rubs on the felt and then stops spinning. If you do that just right, it will actually be not spinning when it makes contact. Then these two will go at 90 degrees. And so you can kind of 
lay out your right your hand out on the pool table and say okay I want that to go in the corner pocket where's the cue ball gonna go and then you give an idea of how hard you're gonna put it so that the cue ball lines you up for the next shot is the whole strategy of the, of the game uh, as a side note if it's rolling it's a little different they come out in a whole slew of angles depending on how hard you hit it but the angles are near 30 degrees uh, not always and so this pool ball will go near 30 degrees when there is rolling regardless of what angle that one is so you don't get the 90 degrees but you always get the what we call the scattering of 30 degrees which is another nice trick take your hand and make a little V that's about 30 degrees and go okay it's going cue ball is going to go that direction and then when it hits it's off of that angle okay so if it's going to go that angle how hard do I need to hit that cue ball so it stops at the right location so I can line myself up for the next next shot there I'll uh, give you something to do over spring break no hopefully you'll be studying there over spring break yeah. but again a couple of problems there uh, I got another one on the list how what time is it here maybe I'll grab Yeah, I had 34, which is another two-dimensional one. I don't know if that will be quite as enlightening, and we'll do one more. But I want to then jump to the other last part of the of the chapter there. Uh, let's try 57. I think 57 is nice uh, because it does then have our conservation of momentum and a little discussion there as well. as a little bit of the earlier stuff that I think we need to keep reviewing as we go along because everything builds on itself and you don't want to forget it. Um, we'll see what happens next fall when you guys come back and somewhere about mid-September we start working with electricity and magnetism and we have these little charges called electrons and protons they go zipping around and all of a sudden the questions start asking what's the acceleration what's the velocity how much distance does it travel and uh, I always got to warn the students don't forget your physics 121 you never know when this comes back to you and says all right we've got some mechanics that we've got to incorporate so we've got all the new stuff but we've got to use that for the purpose of figuring out where is this atom going to land where is the the new position of it or the radius of curvature you know it's like this little electron goes flying through a magnetic field and it makes a curve and the question all of a sudden out of nowhere says what's the radius and that's your clue to remember chapter six. Oh yeah, mv squared over r. We learned that six months ago, but we learned that. And this one does too. This is a little projectile one. It's going to hit this block, and then it's going to shoot off the block, and it's going to go a distance d. So this takes us back to our kinematics here. Watch, it says a bullet of mass, little m, is fired into a block of capital M, initially at rest at the edge of a frictionless table of height h. The bullet remains in the block, and after the impact, the block lands a distance d from the bottom of the table. Determine the initial speed of the bullet. Okay. And so, as it relates to our new material, that is this chapter, I have a conservation of momentum problem. I can say here that the bullet coming in, little m, striking the block of capital M, getting embedded inside of it, and going shooting off with a capital, or a speed of capital V. And so, the little m times the little v, and then equals big M plus little m times capital V. There is our chapter 9, our conservation of linear momentum. Of course, we should probably always pause and say, is momentum conserved for this case? Well, momentum is conserved if there's no outside forces. And maybe I should say net outside 
forces because we had this little piece of the puzzle. Change in momentum is the integral of net force and time. And in this case, they are clearly saying that it sits on the table and the table is frictionless. So there is no horizontal forces. So from that, I would say, yes, I have conservation of momentum. We didn't mention it last time, but in the vertical direction, the, at least at first, the force pushing up from the normal of the table is equal to gravity pushing down. So again, the net force in the y direction is equal to zero. So the momentum in the y direction is conserved at least right at the impact. Now once it flies off the edge of the table, then we don't have a normal force anymore. But we do have a gravitational force. So as it is flying through the air, I would say no momentum is not conserved. There is a force in the y direction. Now there's not in the x direction even while it's flying through the air so I might say it keeps the same momentum in the x direction as it flies through the air. But we already know that from our kinematics. Our kinematics we already said it keeps the same horizontal speed as it flies through the air. It gains speed in the vertical direction. And so again, it's not conserving momentum in the y direction as it flies through the air, but it is conserving it in the x direction. And so I'm going to write this equation here and say, well, this is the speed immediately after the impact. Okay? Then maybe I'll put a little box around it. The reason it's kind of a review problem here is because then it goes flying off the, to the side there and so if I write out my equations of motion here with a constant acceleration being in the y direction, this was one of those equations. We called it equation number two way back in chapter two and in this case it's going to drop down a height h so if I call that height h and then starting at zero, uh, maybe I'll call down negative. Why don't I just be the con normal consistent down negative? I was going to call down positive, but that might lead to more confusion. So I'll just call it down negative. And so its final position is at negative h. <laughs> Calling the table zero, its initial velocity in the y direction is zero. It's going to slide off horizontally. And so we have a negative one half g for the acceleration and then there's the time. And so our first equation from our kinematics is one involving the y motion and pretty standard one you might remember from chapter two. Likewise we can do that in the x direction. X equals to x initial plus initial velocity in the x times time plus one half acceleration in the x direction. And in this case, if we call the edge of the table the origin, then not only is y equal to zero, but x is equal to zero. And in this picture here, they say it lands a distance d. So I will put d here for distance. Its initial velocity in the y direction, I mean, excuse me, the x direction is this one. That's how this chapter and previous chapters tie together and multiplied by time and then I get zero acceleration in the x direction as it is flying off the table. And so now I can make my substitutions. I can put D equals and in place of capital V I can put a little m, a little v over capital M plus little m. And so there's my capital V. And in place of T, I can put a 2H over a G and take the square root of that. And uh, now I forget which they're asking. Oh, determine the initial speed of it. Alright, so a few more steps of algebra and we can solve that then for little v. What is the speed? And so maybe I I was going to square it but I like the v by itself so alright 
uh, capital M plus little m divided by little m multiplied by d. That would kind of be the first steps to get d by itself. Um, then I guess I'd also have the square root of g over 2h should equal little v. So I guess that would be the finishing step here of what is the equation for little v, the velocity of that. So if you actually measured things like the height of the table and the distance it flies and the masses, you should be able to figure out how fast that object is going when it hits it. And that's a lot like the lab you will do um, on, well, not this Monday, but Monday after spring break because we're going to do exactly that. We are going to find out the speed of this little, it's not a bullet, but it's a little plastic ball. We're going to shoot the little plastic ball into our object. We won't fly off the end of the table. What we will do is hook our little, this will be a, a, a little box. We will hook it up here and it will swing upward. And so we will use the gravitational potential energy and how high does it swing upward to tell us something about what was the speed after the impact. And then, getting the speed after the impact, we will then find the speed before the impact. And so hence the name is called the ballistic pendulum because we can get the, the firing speed, the ballistic speed of it, by swinging the pendulum and measuring how high does the, the, the pendulum go. All right, well, in the balance of time that we have left, I need to talk about the last half of this, this chapter. Because all of these were great problems, but they weren't the complete set of problems you were going to face, and they weren't a complete discussion about the system of particles, because all of these, the conservation of momentum, were valid for things that didn't have an outside influence. They only had an influence on each other. Well, let me take this for example. Let me take object one and object two and connect them. Now, this metal rod that's connecting them, let's say the mass of this metal rod is so small that I can ignore it. So really I just have two objects is my point. So I've got two objects. Uh, you, it could be like the earth and the moon, let's say. All right. And so the Earth and the Moon are influencing each other, right? There's forces on, on them. But if there was no other force on the Earth and the Moon, then we would say they would have conservation of momentum, right? And so it's... If I can say this well, uh, it's... For the Earth-Moon, that's not a good discussion to have, is what I'm trying to get at. Isn't there a big influence on the Earth-Moon system? It's called the Sun, right? And so knowing that the Earth and the Moon, without another external force, would conserve momentum, doesn't really help us describe what is going on in our solar system. And so we need another piece to our, our, our puzzle here. And so, as we will soon see here, is what if I were to take this and say, throw it across the room? Wouldn't I have these two being affected by a third object? Let's talk about that for a moment. Those two, but with an outside influence. And then maybe we'll say Earth-Moon system, affected by one outside influence, the Sun. Of course, you can imagine that it, Earth and Moon is more, much more complicated than that because it's also influenced by the other planets around it. But mostly it's influenced by the Sun. But just to give us a starting point here, let's do the same discussion that we had before where we had Object 1 and Object 2. But now, let's add to that Object 3. And object three is an outside force. What are we going to do with problems such as these? All right, well, why don't we label these forces? And as you will see here, the force on number one 
would of course come from number two, but that's not the whole story. What other force is on number one? Isn't there a force on number one from number three? And we can do the same logic with number two. There would be, whoops, I got it backwards. There would be a force from number one on number two. Uh, there, but there would also be a force from number three on to number two. And as far as our outside object goes, there would be a force, um, and this would be from number one on number three, and there would be a force from number two on number three. So how are we going to handle this? Well, we got two options. Option A. If this would make useful sense, we'll do it. What if you change your system? What if we included object number three? Then what? And then we don't have an outside force, right? Then is momentum conserved? Yes. So we can kind of change the problem up a little bit. Instead of just looking at the Earth and the Moon and saying there's an outside force to them, meaning the momentum will change, we can then look at the Earth, Moon, Sun system, collectively, all three of them, and say the total momentum of those three does not change. And so if we think about the Earth, Moon system here, something like this, And as the Earth-Moon system, say, goes around me, I'll be the Sun. If I were to incorporate the third object, me, that means when they're here going that way, what would the Sun have to do? Go that way. As it swings around over to here, and now the Earth-Moon system is going that way, what would the Sun be doing? Going the other way. And so the sun is going to kind of wobble back and forth a little bit, depending on how it goes around. In fact, that is one of a couple of strategies that scientists use to find planets around other star systems, is the, the wobble. Does it, does, it, does it move a little bit? Of course, real good one is, what if it moves in front of the star? kind of gives a little shadowing effect. And so if you measure the intensity from the sun, you'll, you'll see a little dip in there. But anyways, I'm not going to get into exoplanets here too much. Here. But you can see that one strategy is a pretty straightforward strategy, and nothing more needs to be said about it. It just realized that we incorporate this outside object into our system. We then have no outside influences. We then have conservation of momentum, and we solve the problem. Of course, that can't solve all of our complicated problems because what it does is it incorporates this, outside, this, this object into our system and we may know very little about that object and therefore we can't solve the problem. So that one is a good first try and if it works, great, use it. Because conservation of momentum is really nice. But there's more we probably have to do. And we will. Let's do this. Let's not include it into our system. Let's re-talk about this system that then has an outside influence. And in that case, we know its momentum will change. The question just remains, how will it change? And fortunately, it's surprisingly easy. Watch this. If I were to add up all the forces that are on my system, and there's four of them, right? There is the force from number two on number one. There is the force from number three on number one. There is the force um, from number one on number two. 
And there is also the force from number three on number two. And of course, I've only drawn two objects in my system and one outside. So I hope you see kind of the bigger picture here, which is what would you say about that right there? What are those two? They're equal and opposite, right? Anything that comes internally. So all of what we'll call our internal forces are going to give you zero. And you could imagine if I had a third or a fourth object in there that this line of equation would be much longer. But wouldn't you always have an equal and opposite for the internal forces? That's a nice way of saying that the sum of all the forces on my system is really equal to the sum of all the external forces. This is really kind of nice. Finding out what happens to our object means we only have to pay attention to the outside forces. And so whatever is going on between the Earth and the Moon, I don't need to know anything about it. By the way, we have been doing that. We have been doing a lot of problems such as this. Where we would take an object and we would say toss it. And, and what did we say what path it took? Did we say it took a parabola? Did we say it was influenced by the force of gravity? Did we once say that this molecule is hooked to that molecule with a very large electrical force? Did we even pay any attention to that? We did not. And now we can justify why we did not. This first statement is just saying that if you had an object that is made up of hundreds and thousands and millions, or in their case, more than millions, billions upon billions upon billions of atoms. And if you say that that is your system, and each of them interact with these electrical forces, ignore them. That does not determine the overall motion of the object. The overall motion only comes from the external forces. And think about how silly it would be if your car broke down, and as you sit in the driver's seat, you go, uh-oh, I'm stuck. I should probably push the car out of traffic. Why don't I shift it into neutral and push on the dashboard? As you sit in the front seat pushing on the dashboard, is the car going to move? It will not. Why? And that's what I'm trying to illustrate. That, that, that is an internal force. As you push on the dashboard, what's your back doing? Push it on the seat the other way. So as much as you push forward on the dashboard, your back is pushing the car in the other direction. This car will not move with any inside forces. Okay? And so no matter what you do on the inside, you're never going to get it to go. And that's what this is saying. The internal forces do not contribute to the motion of your system. Only the external forces. And so the motion of my Earth-Moon system is determined by the Sun, the Sun alone. Now don't get me wrong, there's still interaction between them and you can imagine they're spinning around each other and that's what we'll see here in just a second. But the total motion is determined solely by the external forces. That's what I'm trying to illustrate. So back to your car. If you really want to get the car out of traffic, you need to get out of the car, right? You need to become external to the car. Which means you've got to put your feet on the ground and now push the car so the car will move. And then you can change the motion of the car. Then you have an external force. And so that's what this first part of the discussion is saying. But I'll continue. Because let's take a closer look at this equation from a different point of view. I'll change colors. What would you say about the sum of those two? Isn't that the sum of all the forces on just object number one alone? So wouldn't that be mass one times acceleration of number one alone? What would this be?
Wouldn't that be the net force on object number two? And so this would be M2A2. Now again, I've only done this with two objects, but I'm hoping you can imagine that if I had a bunch of objects, say N objects, then this is the mass times the acceleration of the individual pieces. Uh, so if I write down what we've done so far, I have one side of the equation which is saying the sum of all of the external forces is equal to the sum of the mass times the acceleration of the individual pieces. And the individual pieces that make up the system, maybe I can view it together as a, as a system. Let's come back to this two-body system. Here's, here's the Earth and here's the Moon. Okay? If I look at them as a system, forget their individual motion, like maybe spinning around themselves, how do they go around the sun? And maybe that's a bad picture because they do go in the same rotation. All right, so we'll do that. But my point is that I can look at it as a whole system. And so I can say, where do you want to think about the summation of the system? Maybe right there, that point will behave as if this one external object is acting on a single point. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not a single point. But I could then write this as saying, let's take mass of the whole system and times the acceleration of the whole system. And so what I'm really saying here is remember all the stuff that we've learned from chapters 1 through 8? Don't forget it because we've learned some fancy things. For example, we learned that if you take this object and you toss it across the room didn't we learn it goes in the shape of a parabola? And what I'm trying to say here is the external force, the earth, is making things move in a parabola so it would make your whole system move in a parabola. Nothing has changed except that our system now has size to it. So when I say this moves in a parabola, there is one point that moves in a parabola. And maybe now you're finally getting the, to the grand finale. If I take this and I toss it across the room, what moves in a parabola? Was it this single object? No. Was it this single object? No. It was what? It was a point that we're going to call the center of the system here. The center of mass. There is a magical point. It happens to be that one. That moves in the shape of a parabola. So we'll take all the stuff we already learned for point objects. And so it wasn't a waste of our time to go through those eight chapters and to think of our object as just a single point. It is still useful. Now that we'll give our object size, we can say if you take this object now and you toss it across the room, that point, if you can kind of watch it, is the point that's making a parabola. What are the other ones doing? Making circles around the parabola. So if I know how to do a parabola and a circle and I put them together, can I get the motion of the individual parts? And that's our strategy. Now, granted, it sounds a lot more complicated than anything we've done, because it is more complicated than anything we've done so far. But that's the strategy. 
The strategy is to not change what we've been doing, but just to remember what we've been doing has been only for point objects, and our objects are not really points. But there will be a point in our system, which we will now start calling the center of mass. In fact, why don't I put that as the sum then of all of the external forces would be equal to the mass of the entire system times the acceleration of this magical point, the center of mass. It doesn't have to be even an object in the system, like in this picture. The center of mass is some place between the two objects, just like this one. The center of mass is between the two objects. So if I have the Earth-Moon system, we know that the sun would make it go in a circle, but what's going in a circle? <laughs> the center of mass. And so if you look closely at the motion of the moon and the motion of the earth around the sun, they're not really circles. They are circles around a circle. And if I throw this across the room, this one does not go in a circle. Well, or a parabola. What happens is this point makes a parabola and this one makes a circle around that parabola. Is that making sense? And when you see that, then all this fancy math that we're going to do, I think, falls into place real nicely. If I were to take this object, and I were to toss it across the room, does it make a parabola? Well, one point makes a parabola, right? And the other points are circles around it. And, if we have enough time, we will calculate that point. But for those of you close enough, you will see that it is colored in red. And that hopefully maybe allow you to see it a little bit. But if I toss this, then that red point will make a parabola. And everything else will be spinning around that red point. And so I can think of that little piece of wood, or this triangle, as a system of billions and billions and billions and billions of little objects called molecules. And when you hook them all together, there is one magical point called its center of mass that will make a parabola. That's what that fancy math is really telling us. So how do we find that center of mass? Well, maybe you'll see it a little bit better here if you incorporate these two sides of the equation. Let me take one more step in mathematics and then try as many examples as we can before we run out of time here today. But if I were to set these two equal, where I have the sum of the individual particles that make up the system, and that's supposed to equal to the mass of the system times the acceleration of the center of mass, then I could rewrite the acceleration of the center of mass as 1 over the total mass of the system times MIAI. Now, that alone does not tell me how to calculate the position. Those are the accelerations. But you guys are excellent. At least I'll find out when I grade number one on the test here. How do you go from acceleration to velocities? You integrate. And then how do I get from velocities to position? I integrate again. And so that hopefully is what you got somewhat close to on the first one, which I know was the hard one on the test. But you were given the force. From that you were getting the acceleration. And the idea was to integrate it twice to get position. So let me do that. If I were to integrate it the first time, I guess I would call this then the speed of the center of mass. And over here, I would get 1 over the whole mass of the system. Let me just put a capital M there. And then it would be a sum of MIVI, because when I integrate acceleration, I get velocities. And if I integrated it a second time, what would I get? And that's the one I really want. This would be the position 
of the center of mass and it would be 1 over the total mass times the sum of mi, ri, and I would add for the number of objects that are in my system. Now, I probably cheated us a little bit because aren't these all vectors? Vectors, vector, 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 vector. And vector, let me not put it over all of them. But the grand finale is these are actually a vector. And so there's really two equations here. It is where is the center of mass in the x position? And where is the center of mass? in the y position. And if you can remember this, this is how you're going to find then the center of mass. And once you know the center of mass, then you know what is going to happen to your system based upon the influence of these outside forces because the outside forces could be just thought of as acting on a point. And that we've been doing for the last eight chapters. In fact, you could probably see the game that we like to play in figuring out what is the motion of the planet, or maybe what's the motion of a sports car. We might say, okay, the motion of the sports car, as it drives down the road, that sports car is being influenced mostly by the road. There's probably some air friction too, but it's the traction of the tires on the road. So if we want to know the behavior of that sports car, we need to know where's the center mass of the sports car. And we can get that by breaking the sports car down into its individual pieces. See, it's made out of an engine, some tires, some seats, and a lot of other stuff. But if I can get the center of mass of each of those individual pieces and then put them together collectively, I can get the center of mass of the sports car. And then I can get the behavior of the, of the sports car. And where it's located is, is absolutely important. And as you probably know, a sports car and a sports utility vehicle do not behave and corner the same way. The position of their center of mass is very different. And so the behavior of that car on the road is very different. As well as weighing different also. But where is that position? Well, to see if I can illustrate it, let's start with a simple one. Here's our little system. If this system was influenced by gravity, and I were to toss this across the room, probably the first thing I would ask myself is, because it's gravity on the outside, it's going to make a parabola, but there's one point that makes the parabola. It's not this, and it's not this. Where is that point? And of course, it doesn't surprise you that I've tied the string right there at its center of mass. You might call it the balance point. Gravity's pulling that one down. Gravity's pulling that one down. And I just got to pull it up. But I don't pull it up here, that doesn't work. I don't pull it up here, that doesn't work. I pull it up here, that does work. That's its center of mass. All right, so let's run through this. This one happens to be three times heavier than that one. So if I were to draw this up here, I might label this as a little m and this as three little m. If I were to say that they are separated by a distance of L, then I can say where is the center of mass? And so like any problem, the center of mass would have to be measured relative to an origin. All right, where would you like to put the origin? Your choice. Some people pick the middle, some people pick the left-hand side, some people pick the right-hand side. I don't care. But I do know this, there is only one center of mass, and how we label it is kind of irrelevant. Looks like some of you are pointing to here, shall we do that? Shall we call that the origin? Okay, so where is the center of mass from that spot? All right. Let's try our math here. According to this, 
the center of mass in the x direction would be 1 over the total mass. Okay, well the total mass is 4m, isn't it? So here is 1 over the total mass. And then I would have to add up the mass times the position of those two objects. So I guess its mass is 3m, but its position is at 0. Fair enough? The other object has a mass of m and a position l. So when I add these together, that's a 0, and so I just get m over l. m's cancel. And I get 1 quarter of l. And so this particular object has a center of mass one quarter of the way. Not surprising, it's closer to the bigger one. You can hopefully see that in the math. This is really what we might call a weighted average. You are trying to find the position. You are adding up the positions, but it's a weighted position. And so you're adding up one and adding up another and another and another and another and another. And so my center of mass should be about a quarter, and so in this picture it would be right there. And of course, on mine, it's a quarter of the distance over, drill a hole, tie a string. And there's the center of mass. Let's try a different one. 37 is a, is a good one. It's got this little engine part, and that's where I was thinking about the sports car. Is that you would have a, I guess it starts down here, but you might have a bunch of pieces on your sports car, um, and then maybe you have to add another one. This, you'll see this little piece is maybe like a heat shield or something. But you want to go, okay, well now where's the, the new center of mass? Uh, here's what it says. It says a, a uniform piece of sheet steel is in the shape as shown in the figure, and the figure is on the top there, and I'll scroll over there. It says compute the x and y coordinate of the center of mass of this piece. So here's this metal piece. And like I said, I, I would like to know where its center of mass is. Because when I add this to something, then I want to know the total center of mass of the whole system. Or maybe, maybe I just want that piece by itself. I don't know why, but maybe I want to throw that piece across the room. <laughs> and I know that it's going to then follow a parabola. But what point is going to be following a parabola? Because once I get that point, then I know that the other points are going to rotate in circles around that. Which, by the way, is why the next chapter is all about rotation and rotating in circles and all of a rigid objects rotating. And so that's our next part of this discussion. But at least this is getting us started here. Where is the position of the center of mass? All right. And so let's see if I can kind of draw that object up here. Number 37 uh, looks like this once it's been cut. Right? So there's the shape of that. Probably with a giant piece of sheet metal and they, they cut it out. And they give dimensions. It's, it's each little cut here is 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters, 30 centimeters, 20 centi or 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters, and 30 centimeters. Where's the center mass? Well, yes, like any question, the first thing is where are you going to measure it from? Where do you want to put the origin? Well, maybe I'll put that corner as the origin down there. And to find the center of mass, why don't I think of this as six individual squares put together? Because do you know the center of mass of the individual squares? And 
hopefully without doing too much math, is, wouldn't the center of the square be the center of mass? Do you kind of see it in this equation that I, well, I guess I erased it, but I'll, I'll put it back up here. If I start adding these things, x equals 1 over m times, well, the summation of the individual pieces. But do you see if you have something that is uniform in shape, you're going to have an equal mass on each side. And so we start adding those up, you're going to get right in the center. So I would encourage you on this one to chop it into something that you know where the center of mass is. Which in this case I know it is a square. And think of it as a sum of six squares. All right. So if we call little m the mass of each individual square, then this right here becomes 1 over 6m, right? And then I have six pieces to add together. Let's start with this first one. This first one would have a mass of m, and what position would it be at? And I say it's position, I mean it's position of its center of mass. Isn't it at 5? Let's go across the bottom. The second one here, what's its position? Isn't it at 15? Let's do the next one. Isn't it at 25? All right, let's go right above it. What's the center of mass of this one? Now on the x-axis, it's still 5, isn't it? In fact, isn't that one at 5? So aren't all three of these at 5? So would it be okay if I just put a 3 out in front there? I've got, I've got three of them at position 5. And then how about this last one? It's at position 15, right? So isn't that a 2? And of course then there's an M in the top of all of these and in the bottom. That's going to cancel off. And so let's see what do I have here. This is a 15, this is a 30, and this is a 25. Uh, 25, 30, 40, and then doesn't it make 70 over 6? <coughs> Now, before I put this final answer down, where would you kind of expect the center of mass to be? I mean, had it been a complete square, wouldn't you have expected the center of mass to be right here in the middle of 15? And see how we've cut off some pieces on this side? So what would you expect the center of mass to be? This direction? Right? Maybe, maybe as far as 10, maybe not. In fact, 60 divided by 6 is 10, so it's not quite 10. Um, 66 is 11, so it's 11 and 2 thirds. Is that what I have there? And so at 11 and 2 thirds, right about here, must be the center of mass. <clears throat> and then we could certainly do that in the y direction also, couldn't we? So we could figure out where is the center of mass, both x and y. And that will be the point that would be equivalent to having all of this mass at that center of mass. That would be its behavior of this big object. So, so the first time, the, for the first time this semester, we can actually give size to our objects. And once we give size, we can make them rotate. And we can do a lot more realistic physics going forward than we've done in the past. Because our objects really have size. They're not these little points that we've been kind of just saying, oh, it's a little point. Don't worry about its size. In fact, a lot of you even asked that on the test. You kept asking me these little weights. Oh, are, you, are you measuring from the top of the weight or the bottom of the weight? And I'm like, well, whatever you want to do. Because we haven't done anything with size yet. Right? <laughs> That's about to change. 
And so when we do gravitational potential energy now, we'll want to know how much did the center of mass change. How high is the center of mass? Not the bottom, not the top. Where's the center of mass? And so all these will become real important here. <coughs> all right. Well, looking in the y direction. Same logic. It's 6m for the mass of the individual pieces. Looking at this first box right here, it has a position of 5. in the vertical. In fact, all three of these boxes have a position of 5 on the vertical. So I'm going to put a 3 out in front. The next box, or square, has a value of 15. And there's only one of those. And that one has 25. But there's two of them. And so this is a 50, and this is a 15, and this is a 15. So when I add them together, I will get an 80 over a 6. And let me ask the same thing. Before I actually punch in this number, where would you expect it to be? Again, if it was a perfect square, wouldn't you expect the center of the mass to be right at the center of 15? But we have cut some off. And in the vertical way, we've cut it off at the top, so that should lower it down. Just like the horizontal, we said we cut it off over to the right, so it moved it over to the left. There was more weight over to the left. However, I would say that in the x direction, I cut two off of the right. Where in the vertical one, I'm only cutting one off of the top. So although it'll say it moves down, I would say it probably doesn't move down as much as the X moved over. So I don't think it's going to come out to be an 11. I think it will be more than 11 and 2 thirds. But on the other hand, I think it will be under the 15. And so sure enough, when I divide those two, um, let's see, 12 is 72, 13 is 78. So I get 13 and a third. And so sure enough, it would be down a little from 15, but not as much. And so right there, there's the center of mass. If you were to take that object and toss it, it would go a circle around that point. That point would make a parabola. Did you also notice that that point's not even part of the metal itself? That, that, that's really not relevant. I mean, you can imagine a ring. Where's the center of mass of a ring? <laughs> the center of the ring. Is there any mass there? No. How about a basketball? Where is the center of mass of a basketball? Which you get extra coin credit points if uh, UCLA wins Friday night, by the way. Oh, no. <laughs> they make it on. Uh, but isn't the center of mass of the basketball in the center of the basketball? Is there any mass there? No. And, and so the center of mass of the system is just that. It's the system. It's the mass collectively for the whole thing. It is not where one individual object is. Of course, if there's no mass there, you could not do something like this where you can tie a string and hold it there. That's a bummer. And if you wanted just to tie a string onto this and hold it so that it doesn't twist or doesn't rotate, you, you can't because you can't, there's no, nothing to tie it on there. I guess we can tie a series of strings from here to here to here and make them all in a knot right there and then hold it at that point. But without some material there, we can't tie anything to it. Well, I think you're getting the idea. Let's try another one. A little more complicated. And then another one if we got time after that, but unfortunately probably not. So we'll save the, uh, oh here's a great one. Doesn't surprise me it's magenta, it's your homework problem. But if your body is in this shape like that, besides being injured, where's the center of mass of that?
probably what maybe here below the bar itself so the whole art here is this person is going over the bar but not really ever jumping higher than the bar in terms of energy and in terms of the system you won't have to do the person but you are asked to find the center of mass of that arc and as you'll see it's it's down here and so the material itself can actually go over the bar without the giving it enough energy to ever be higher than the bar and so that's the whole idea of that Fillsbury flop technique here um, what number did I say though 40 oh let me go back here ah there it is 43 the Romeo and Juliet one and so in the time we have left let's see if we can at least do the Romeo and Juliet and it'd be nice to do one with a little calculus also but let's see where this gets us and so maybe we'll set the half circle up here and ask what's the center of mass of the half circle since you're going to do actually an easier one than that you're going to do the the arc all right but let's do the Romeo and Juliet because I think it answers our question and it, it, it's got not only a calculation but it's got the concept I, I love this question because if you don't get the concept people are just stuck they go I, I have no idea what to do well, it says here Romeo who is 77 kilograms is entertaining Juliet who does not appreciate her weight being shared at 55 kilograms uh, by playing his guitar in the rear of the boat and rest in still water which is 2.7 meters away from Juliet who is in front of the boat after the serenade Juliet then carefully moves to the rear of the boat which is away from the shore to plant a kiss onto Romeo's cheek how far does the 80 kilogram boat move towards the shore it is facing? I mean, I mean just understanding the problem is, is, is a big step here. All right, what, what, what is going on here? We've got this boat that looks like it is pointing towards and headed towards shore. So here is maybe the shoreline, and here is the water line. Okay. And then it sounds like in the rear of the boat, we have Romeo at 77 kilograms. And in the front of the boat, we have Juliet at 55 kilograms. They are in an 80 kilogram boat. And then after the serenade, things change here. We now have a new distribution to Romeo and Juliet. They are each in the rear of the boat. The question says, how far did the boat move to the shore? My first question for you is why would the boat even move? Still, like the water. Go on. Like she's putting frictional force on the boat and then the boat's like still moving through the water. Okay, so think about Juliet, right? Juliet, in order for her to walk this way, doesn't she have to push on the boat? So she pushes herself this way, but at the same time, she's pushing the boat that way, right? So is it because the central mass is moving but the internal forces is still moving? Uh, let me add to that. Uh, let me not completely answer that, but let's just start here. So, so see how there is going to be some movement? In fact, as Juliet walks, she pushes and she starts going that way, so doesn't the boat have to go that way? Right? In fact, if we think as these three is our system, Romeo, Juliet, and the boat, and as you're pointing out, there is the boat is purposely put in the water so that you could say there's no friction between the boat and the water. There is then no external forces going on. Fair enough? That is, we have conservation of momentum. So, 
if Juliet, Romeo, and Boat, as it says, are rest in calm water, they're not moving, wouldn't I say the momentum is zero of the whole system? And so what happens when Juliet starts walking? In this case, away from the shore. Doesn't that mean the boat has to go the other way? Doesn't the momentum have to be equal and opposite? So the total is zero. But that's an important step here, is to realize that the momentum is not going to change. It's zero before Juliet starts walking. It's zero why while Juliet is walking. It is zero after Juliet stops walking. There are no external forces. So if there's no external forces and no momentum, then what would you say about the center of mass? And this is the key to the problem. Doesn't move. Exactly. And good, because a minute ago you said it was moving, didn't you? So Juliet moves this way. Right. Boat moves that way in order for the center of mass not to move. There's the key to this problem. Center of mass will not move. The rest of it's actually pretty easy mathematics beyond that. But the physics here at the beginning is the hard part. To know that wherever the center of mass is, before Juliet starts to walk, is where it will remain while she's walking and even after she's walking, it does not move. So if she moves one way, boat has to move the other, so center mass does not. Is that a consequence in the first law, or do we, do we need the conservation of momentum? Yeah, I, yeah you, I would say you don't really need conservation of momentum for, for that. Yeah. And, I'm, and, and, and I mean, it's true that the momentum doesn't change, it, and it's true it's zero the whole time. But I'm going to just attack the problem by just knowing the center mass is not going to move and then solve the problem that way. Okay, so keeping that in mind, and, ooh, and we've only got a few minutes left here, let's write out the equation. Why don't we calculate where is the center of mass of Juliet? Before she moves. Now, of course, to do that, I'll need a grid system. So why don't I go ahead and put Juliet as the reference point of the, the grid. If I were to go ahead and calculate the center of mass, then I guess I would say it's 1 over the total. And so that is 55 plus 77 plus 80. So there's the total mass of the three systems, the two people and the boat. And then I would have the mass of Juliet, 55, at position 0. I would have the Romeo at 77 and a position of 2.7, which, by the way, I got the 2.7 because doesn't he say that Romeo is in the rear of the boat, 2.7 meters away from Juliet. Okay, so there's Romeo's position. The boat, ooh, I don't really know where the center of the mass of the boat is. It, it's probably close to the center of the boat, but most boats are not equally weight front and back. And I don't know if this is kind of a rowboat, but if it was a, a little motor, even just a small trolling motor, that would put even more weight in the back. So I would expect the center mass to be certainly not in the center. And fortunately, as you'll see in a second, I, I don't need to know it. So I'm just going to say it's D. And so up here in my drawing, maybe I'll just label right there. I'm sorry, X. I'll label that as X. That's the center mass of the boat. I don't know where it is. But let's do this again, after Juliet walks over to Romeo. What would be the total mass now? Well, that hasn't changed. Juliet, still 55 kilograms. But where is she? 
Did she have two points up? No, no, no. She, I mean, I, I agree. She moved. So she starts walking. But didn't the boat and Romeo move towards her as she was walking? Right? Well, wasn't that our whole discussion five minutes ago? So does Juliet walk the whole 2.7? No. In fact, in my drawing, I may put something like the front of the boat would now be, say, right here. And so let's call this distance D that the boat moved towards the shore. Which is the question, right? The question is how far does the boat move? Does that help? Where is Juliet then? 2.7 minus D, isn't she? And where's Romeo? Romeo also moved over D. And where's the center mass of the boat? <laughs> X minus D, right? The, the boat moved also a D. All right. And so now I could set those two equal to each other, couldn't I? And fortunately, although I guess we're out of time here, so maybe I won't take the time to try and do the math. But do you see this 80x would show up with that 80x on each side of the equation? So it's going to cancel off. And now you're going to have a bunch of stuff that has a D in it. And after a couple of steps of algebra, you can solve for D. Uh, so again, notice, I don't think the math was too hard as much as the physics was. The boat moved. Why did it move? What didn't move? The center of mass. Where is Romeo's new position? Where is Juliet's new position? Is probably the hardest one to know that. All right. Well, I guess we'll have to stop there and not show you any center masses with the calculus. I'll let you 